This time on Standard Bread. The initially unlikely but progressively predictable story of New Zealand's champion breeder of Standard Bread racehorses. At 15 I announced to the world, I've said this many times, that I was going to have a horse farm. Brian West concedes he's in the twilight of his pro horse breeding career. So champion breeder of New Zealand now after how long? 43 years. But the former supermarket supply salesman has his horse enterprise producing its greatest results ever. It's taken literally a lifetime to put together. Standard Bread is supported by a stable of key players in the New Zealand Standard Bread breeding and racing industries. Beautiful. A lot of work, but very. it's just a wonderful place to live in. I could recall the first morning waking up here, we'd, we'd shifted in and we'd, we'd just camped down in the lounge of the old, of the old homestead. Yeah. And I remember waking up and it was nine in the morning. We couldn't believe it was nine, but there was no noise here. There was no road noise. And we used to joke that uh, when four cars had gone through the, in the morning, that we used to call that the peak hour, the peak traffic hour. <laughs> Against the odds, and by breeding superior standard bred racehorses, Brian West has found his perfect place at Coes Ford, southeast of Christchurch, New Zealand. At 15, I announced to the world, and I've said this many times, that I was going to have a horse farm without any farming background or any horse background. For New Zealand's champion standard bred breeder, it's taken passion, perseverance, patience and ages. I, I never ever envisaged that I, I would be um, New Zealand Breeder of the Year. I, I, I saw the powerful individuals, the men with money, um, and what, what we've achieved here in, in those years is that we've got ourselves a farm, we've got ourselves a band of broodmares now. It's taken literally a lifetime to put together. West has his Studham Park horse enterprise producing its greatest results ever, in the nick of time, he reckons. I look ahead and, I, and I, I try and envisage where I think this business will be in 10 years' time, and five years' time, and I, I've, I've, I've got a, I'm not saying I'm right, but I've got a feeling I know where it's going to go, and I have a feeling um, that it's going to be harder. In this unlikely but ultimately predictable success story, the moral might be make sure you're well prepared for what might be around the corner. So we better talk about the house or we bet it's got ghosts? I believe so. No. Truly. You yes. believe in ghosts? Steve. I never did, but I do now. So was there a story behind them? Um, no, oh, I'm, I'm unaware of, 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 of the history. However, I do know that um, others have lived in here, including the family before us all said the same. And you hear voices, I, I, I know this sounds a bit weird and, and I, I'm not going mad because I certainly wasn't a believer in ghosts till I come here, but I, I'm not certain it's ghosts or spirits or what it is, but there's something going on in that house. Old books, biscuits, started here, believe it or not. After floods swept away crops and the sheep being farmed, Bruce Coe Lodge became a resting lodge for Canterbury traders and travellers in the era of horses, wagons, wheat and Allsbrook's biscuits. And this farm was established in 1863, as with the buildings here, the old buildings, the old house and the barn. We came here to retire, or start taking life a bit easier, and then the adjoining 300 acres become available. So we decided to buy it. And um, the reason I, I bought it was I needed somewhere to go because we'd sold Marsh's Road to a developer. So we kind of needed somewhere to house the 50 horses we had at the time. Yeah. Glorious, really. It's just a wee bit close to the Selwyn River. A wee bit close? <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, actually, that's probably an advantage uh, in some ways because the, the, the soil types from the river through to the, to the road, this end, uh, the southern end, uh, changed from um, sort of light sandy soils through to heavy soils so we can winter at that end, the, the river end, believe it or not, that's, that's, the, that's the place to put the stock in the winter because the um, drainage is superb. The 
because this is where the homestead was going to be. But of course, oh, the river yeah. flooded and they realised they couldn't have the homestead here. <laughs> so they put the homestead on the only dry part of the farm in that, in that first flood. First time ever the river breached into the farm via the flood bank, over the flood bank. If you look across here where the flood bank is, you'll see it just to the right, uh, right this corner of this paddock here, how, it, how the flood bank dips a fraction, that's where it breached and created the problems. Luckily it was in this corner of the farm. Uh, which meant that it then flowed to the sea out, out through, uh, out, out, that, out that side as against coming through here. We do have a boat, we need it, a rowboat. <laughs> We've gone from being pretty seriously in trouble last, this last summer in terms of the, the dry ground, the drought we had here, uh, to now we've got um, sufficient water to give us a fantastic summer. You can hear the water running here, that's, that's, a, that's a artesian water running here freely. I've just recently employed a heritage gardener to come in here and sort this area here. Yeah. And he's done a lot of work because you, this was like a bush, you couldn't actually see into here. Yeah. But this is going to go back to, uh, to being like sort of something you can stroll through and have a little pathway and, and we'll be able to identify the trees. And if you walk around this farm, you'll see trees here that have like a copper plaque at the bottom of them. And, and in those early days, because there was all these large runs established with the early settlers, they would, uh, when, when a farm was being developed, the, the, the farms in the neighbourhood would present a tree. Well, okay. the, the, the beauty of the trees and the bird song, and I had, I can, I'd have to say, I, I didn't value any of that until I came here. Today, the 150 plus year old lodge is a beauty spot for Brian West who's focused on the setting, giving Studham Park standard breads even more success in its and his twilight years. Well, I'm rising 67 uh, and I, like, I can't do this forever. Yeah. So I have to be very careful and considerate about what I'm going to leave behind in terms of what workload yeah. for others to even think about. And so by the time I'm 70, uh, I want to be down to uh, just having 20 breeding stock, that's fillies and or mares, Elite. some fillies that will be racing, yeah. The Southern Bloodstock can continue to trade, I believe, until I'm gone. And what will happen then, I'm, I'm not sure with it. Um, neither of my two children uh, are, have an involvement in the world, in, the, in this racing world. And my son follows it, but he's not into it. And um, my oldest grandson is here now, but he, he would rather farm. Would, they, would these make the cut or would they? Are these mares here? Yeah. Uh, well, only time will tell that because what we do is when we commit a when we commit a filly or a mare to a uh, to a breeding program, uh, if we decide to breed her commercially, uh, and that's the decision that's either in or out. Now uh, we we will breed at least three foals, maybe four, and then we put those mares aside. And I could take you to another paddock on the farm here, where there may be twenty horses sitting waiting for their to their, for their future to be decided. And that's based purely on whether or not the progeny they produce. Uh, commercial and successful. These are uh, new projects. Uh, the mare on the left hand side is a one race winning mare called Secret Lotion, who is a full sister by Courage Under Fire to Secret Potion, the, uh, our good filly of some years ago. Uh, that's her first foal, it's a colt by Better's Delight. So that foal has everything going for it in, in terms of commercial appeal and should be able to create some reasonable income for us come yearling sale time. The foal uh, we're looking at directly in front is uh, an art major filly okay. out of a, and the mare's called Odds and Ends. She's a Mac 3 daughter of a Better's Delight daughter of Undercover Lover. And that's where this business has to be. We've got to be in that top commercial appealing end now. Pedigree's superb. Both these mares have superb pedigrees. But I don't see Studham um, being a company that will survive my death within a period of time. Like to know more about racing or breeding standard breeds? Find the New Zealand Standard Bred Breeders on Facebook or go to the Breeders website.
A rock and roll dance is two lengths clear. A rock and roll dance, a multiple world record holder, the richest two-year-old of his year, the winner of the Meadowlands Pace at three. A rock and roll dance, 148 and one in the Meadowlands Pace. His first two-year-olds are now here. He's now one of the leading first season sires in North America and is now set to make his mark on the racetracks of New Zealand. Simply no other sire is better positioned for the future. Terra to love is storming home. The four-year-old Terra to love and Jimmy Curtin won it. Here's Terra to love again. Terra to love comes up down with Terra to love on the cut. It is still Terra to love. He's going to do it. It is the greatest cup win of all time. The gold cup of Ricky May has won the greatest race you will ever see. Standard Bread is supported by a stable of key players in the New Zealand Standard Bread breeding and racing industries. Bit of a legend, it's the new leader on its outside and whacking away five car draw, but it's bit of a legend aided by a flying middle section and bit of a legend won it. You could say Brian West has slowly become a bit of a legend in the standard red breeding world. I don't know where it's come from. It was just an instant attraction to the horse. As a young man, I used to get dropped off at the AMP show and I spent all day, in fact, I used to get dropped off at 6.30 in the morning, as often as I could, and I would spend all day there just looking at animals, mainly horses, and I'd sit at the, in the grandstand there and just watch what was going on. I was fascinated by them. I, I can't tell you what that's about because um, my parents have never stepped foot on the racetrack. I used to go to the trots uh, as a young man uh, with a group of us from school. We'd go to the trots. Um, I went with my grandfather when I was about, um, he had a mate, they used to go to the occasional trotting meeting and I went to a couple of country meetings with them. Uh, and I used to go in those days because I used to enjoy the lunch, the big packed lunch in the back of the car, that was fun. Uh, but the horses also, I loved the colours and then of course Addington Raceway with night racing as a young man. Um, and, and liked to have a wee bet. I wasn't a punter, but I liked to have a bet. Hardly ever have a bet these days, but um, that was part of it. And I, but I don't see that being the reason that I'm here now. Um, I, somehow I was pulled into breeding, and I remember I used to study the, um, the Turf Digest, and I was regularly caught at school with my Turf Digest or Best Bets open inside a book, and I'd be, I'd be caught out, and I'd be studying, and studying, and I used to look at the breeding, and I used to be able to sort of recite what the horse was buying out of, and, I hardly knew anything about pedigree, I might tell you, but somehow that, that, I don't know why, but that's the path I took. Like many keen youngsters with an eye on horses as a living rather than just a hobby, he had to respect some early restraint. Well, I left school to be an accountant and work in a bank. It's a and long way from horse farm, isn't it? Miles away. Um, I guess you're going to run it financially, I suppose. That's some sort of connection, but yeah. I, well, I wanted to learn about money and how to, how, to, how to trade and do those sort of things. And my only strength at school was mathematics. The bank job didn't last long? Six months. Um, and I knew then that this wasn't my career path at all. It wasn't at all um, fascinating or interesting. And what happened then was I went to speak to my father about what I was going to do. I, I, I didn't want to proceed with the bank career. And, and the accounting degree. And he um, was very unhappy with that decision. In fact, to such a point, I thought, well, he'd never react as, that strongly ever, um, but then I'd said to him. So I decided I shouldn't follow that path now. So I pulled back and got a, uh, applied for a position for a company called uh, CS Agencies, which is kind of like a rural supplies company and an offshoot of them. It was called Cudden and Stewart and an offshoot was this company I worked for. This is the early days of supermarkets of course. Um, I was a young man, probably 19. Um, the, the, the company made the trolleys and made display merchandising equipment, that kind of stuff. Um, so that became my life for 18 years. 12 of it with that company and then for the last six I had my own business. Supermarket supplies might have been a significant and viable distraction, but hardly enough to dull a deep desire to have that horse business sooner than later. And then I decided, it was late 80s, uh, to take the hobby, which was now the horses, and I'd bred my first horse at the age of 23, uh, into, a, into a professional 
um, manner where I would try and create a living from that. So I, I gave it two years. To my, I said, I'll give, I told the two, the two kids who were 11 and 14 at the time, we'll do this for two years and if it doesn't work out, we'll, I'll do something else. So at the end of two years, it was kind of break even and I thought I'll give it two more and at the end of that two, we were doing okay. I, I, I was fully committed now on that journey. However, we had to sell every horse we bred in those days. Every single yearling was sold off so we could keep ticking over. Those earlier days, I'd go to any dispersal sale and I'd attend every yearling sale and just watch. And I um, was fascinated by that world, I might tell you. And then, um, I, then I started inc increasing the pedigree aspect of the business. I started improving and trading so that I would buy and sell fillies and mares regularly. Uh, until we got a, a line of horse, uh, and, and that uh, line of a, a line based of breeding stock that was at the initial Yonkers breeding partnership. Of course, in those days, uh, we we didn't have access to what we have today. We didn't have access to the greatest stallions available in the world. We we had second-rate stallions because they were sent down under, and and no one down under could have afforded. Uh, the service fees that we have to, we're having to pay today. So, what did that environment mean? Was there a lot of hit and miss going on? Or? Well, well, because because we we were pretty insulated and isolated away from the rest of the world. So, the only way we could improve our bloodlines was to get to frozen and or what became shuttle shuttle stallions, which we should be forever grateful to two people, John Curtin and his American mate Jack Rice, because it was Jack Rice who challenged. Um, I think it was the Ohio size stakes board, which eventually, after a set of court cases, opened up the shuttle business for us. So that changed the whole dynamics of our business. And of course, that shuttling business now is, is, is now um, also part of the thoroughbred world. Have we progressed really quickly since that started, do you think? Dramatically. We're now competing. We'll look at a bit of a legend. We can, we can breed horses here now that uh, can, can compete with the best horses the states can breed. Uh, and I think also that one of the fascinating things for us also now is we can, we can import semen from so many different countries. We've got you know, Europe, we've got the, the French trotters, and what a marvellous job they're doing. They've changed the whole dynamics of the trotting world. Before that, um, Sundon was a massive influence. And if you look now at the Sundon influence and now the introduction of the Anglo-European trotting blood. It's, it's just sensational for us. It's the leggy, the flashy chestnut, Paramount King clinging on and winning it. Paramount King ahead. To join the harness racing and breeding conversation, you can make contact with your standard bred breeders associations across New Zealand. A rock and roll dance is two lengths clear. A rock and roll dance, a multiple world record holder, the richest two year old of his year, the winner of the Meadowlands Pace at three. A rock and roll dance, 148 and one in the Meadowlands Pace. His first two year olds are now here. He's now one of the leading first season sires in North America and is now set to make his mark on the racetracks of New Zealand. Simply no other sire is better positioned for the future. glad you're at the top of it now. What's your view of it? Uh, am I glad I'm at the top of it? Oh, I'm, I'm kind of, I've enjoyed the journey, don't get me wrong. It's been frustrating, difficult. Um, there's parts of it I'm, I'm un, I've been unhappy about, but I don't want to go down that path. As the next horse breeding year starts, an opportunity to sit and ponder on Studham Park's success 
and how the supermarket supplier in his early 20s has taken until his mid-60s to get his dream in order. Are breeders uh, nurtured enough in the game, you think? Um, good question. I feel if we'd had a better structure where licence holders, breeders and owners, who are the business, elected their board of governors, we would have a different outcome today. But we haven't had that. And anybody, and I've seen a lot of good young people in my, in my lifetime go and try to change things and they get basically hammered. It's been a problem for me, but I've found it uh, a problem that is, is just saps your strength, it takes your focus away from what you're doing. I've had to walk away from that and, and there may be people that are critical of the fact that I've taken no real uh, role in doing anything about it, but I've seen too many people come out of it too frustrated. I've had to concentrate fully on making stud and bloodstock survive, and that's been the thrust for me for all these years since 1989, as a on a full-time basis. Um, so that's my structure. Can we change it? It's too late to change it. I feel I don't think you can change it. I I, I, I look ahead and, I, and I, I try and envisage where I think this business will be in 10 years' time, and five years' time, and I I've I've, I've got a I'm not saying I'm right, but I've got a feeling I know where it's going to go, and I have a feeling. Um, that it's going to be harder, there'll be less breeders, but they'll be bigger, and there'll be less racetracks, and there'll be less racing clubs, they'll combine, and, and that's the focus for me. I feel that um, if, if the business had been, I, th I think, um, administered correctly and properly, breeders would have been given an incentive to breed. Um, it's extremely, extremely hard for breeders to keep the head above water financially. So champion breeder of New Zealand now after how long? 43 years. Why did it take so long? You're surprised it took so long? Is it something you really wanted to achieve? It sounds like it did without, you know, without the plaudits, but that's where you were headed. No, I, I never ever envisaged that I, I would be um, New Zealand Breeder of the Year. I, I, I saw the powerful individuals, the men with money, um, and what, what we've achieved here in, in those years is that we've got ourselves a farm, we've got ourselves a band of broodmares now that's taken literally a lifetime to put together, and it's a very difficult path. Would I encourage someone to, to do this? You'd have to be very, very passionate. You'd have to be what, you'd have to be a Brian West, as I was as a young man, wanting to do this and driven by this because it's a very, it's a difficult world. And I, it's not just breeders, it's all for, for license holders, it's right across our spectrum, it's right across every aspect of racing or, or breeding horses, racing horses, whatever you do in the world, it's a very, very difficult world to trade in, I feel. And, it's, and that, that, that's my experience and my summary. So this sit down with Standard Bread is about as close to a committee meeting or industry think tank as Brian West gets. Twilight or not, He's at the top of the game he spent a lifetime loving in his own way. What gets your juices flowing in the game these days, this far into it now? Um, what I tend to do in the winter, I lock myself away. I generally go away for a month or two, and I, uh, that's kind of my study period where I, I look at what's going on around the world. I look at our pedigrees. I look at what's happening with the families. I make decisions commercially, um, what I think I need to do to get us through the next couple of years. Um, what excites me is, um, is as I envisage what, what will happen and I, I want to see Auckland's very exciting for us. Uh, I prefer to race my fillies up there, have done for a long time. Um, I think we'll have, uh, I, I see Auckland, uh, Eddington and maybe one major basin in Southland as being all we require in terms of racetracks. Best bred horse? Well, there's, I, I'd, I'd have to name three, but the first is Secret Potion because when I set out, that was my only goal, was I wanted to breed an Oaks winner. And I thought at the time, even if I can't afford to race it, and I didn't think I'd be able to do that, I might say, um, I, I, I was, that, was, that was my goal. Win an Oaks, and when Secret Potion won, and, my, and we owned it, that was my whole goal. So like setting that, setting that way back 40 years ago, uh, and uh, as, a, as a, a goal. We got it in Auckland a few years ago 
and then of course a bit of a legend came on and won Breeders' Crowns 2 and 3. Now we've got Lazarus, so like, I, I can't, I feel I can't do any more than that. I've sort of done as much as I can possibly achieve, and yet they, they were two areas that I, I, I really didn't think I'd even think about. I, well, I didn't think about achieving them, so if I had to name one, it would be Secret Potion, because that was my ultimate goal. How did Lazarus come about? Had, had, uh, right, simple, uh, phone call from Gavin Chin, my mate down in Mosgill. He'd purchased the mare. I'd, I don't, I'd, I'm not even sure where I was when he called me, whether I was here or overseas, but um, he asked um, would I, uh, could he send it here and would I breed it with him to get, a, get, him start, get the mare started. That's how it started. So we bred two foals, um, an Art Major filly and then Lazarus. And then uh, we lost a pregnancy and then I couldn't get her in foal. And then because I then decided to downsize uh, over the next six years, um, I t t to Gavin that um, I'll, I'm pulling out of the mare. But it is all Lazarus clear of Tiger Tara. And once again, Lazarus has arisen. And magnificent pedigree. Um, Peter's delight, one of the greatest sires of all time, um, worldwide and out of a Cullen Mia, out of a glorious family. You know, the, everything's there. Everything was set for that horse to be a star. And what's the next one? The next star? Yeah. Oh, I think Great stallion, great pedigree. Well, um, some beat somewhere is going to leave a champion. Um, when he's, he, well, he's definitely more than a champion. Uh, he will leave a star from our draft here at some point. We've, we've only had limited shots at him. We're going to breed seven mares to him this year. Um, yeah, he's the, he's the boy. So much for waking up with the birds in some paradise somewhere just yet then. So um, why didn't you just retire then? Well, I did. I planned to. Um, I did. I actually, um, why didn't I? Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, wake up at nine o'clock in the morning is beautiful. Let's not worry about the work thing. We'll just live. Well, when we've had a difficult day, we might have had a difficult following or we've got problems on the farm, you know, with stock. Um, I think about that regularly. Why didn't I? And I did come here to actually semi-retire. And that was 14 years ago, but we're, we're bigger in terms of um, breeding numbers now than uh, we've been for 15 years. Uh, and we've done that so that we can survive. And this is really about how we've been able to make the horse business, the breeding business, stand alone and actually create an income for itself so that we can live. Like most hooked by the horse game, Brian West doesn't really want to retire. Relaxing a little is about all he'll manage. So what you need is the lamb, those couple of horses, and that's it. Correct. Yeah, nine o'clock brunch. Correct. New Zealand's champion standard bread breeder has plenty going on around his place to give him some edge yet. What are they saying? Well, uh, you, you know, all you hear is, t you hear, you actually hear two voice tones. You hear a male and a female. You can't hear specific words, but you hear like a conversation going on. There's something going on in that house. So what, what You're invited saying? to stay over and find out for yourself. So they're not saying things like, breed it to better's delight. <laughs> no, no they're not. I say that in the sleep probably. <laughs> <laughs>